Hi, welcome to Blogging Hits TV. This is Culturally Determined. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade. Uh, my guest today probably needs no introduction for the vast majority of the Blogging Heads Culturally Determined audience. Uh, it is John McWhorter. Uh, John, can you introduce yourself for anyone who possibly doesn't know who you are? <laughs> well, I'm one of the black guys at Blogging Heads, usually. But I think today the idea is to not talk with Glenn Lowry, but to talk about my book, Nine Nasty Words, which is about profanity. Yes. And it's kind of a history of profanity, and it, it basically introduces what we think of as the bad words. It also includes what we now think of as slurs, which really are today's profanity. And the book came out a couple months ago, and I intended it as kind of a jolly tonic after a year and change of you-know-what, and hopefully it is that. Uh, well, thank you for coming on and talking about the book. I, yeah, it is. It's a fun read. It is... Um... You know, it, it's it, it reminds me a lot of your uh, of Lexington Valley and the tone you have in that, and bringing in, uh, you know, old cultural references from uh, musicals that I've never heard of, and <laughs> no one old, cares about, and old right, Looney yeah. Tunes cartoons, and using them to illustrate various interesting points. And yeah, you, it's a, a light tone throughout. And um, so I should say, you know, that I, I don't think any children usually watch or listen to these episodes, but we're going to be saying a lot of these bad words. I think at least we're going to be saying them. And so probably, you know, if you have a small child in the car or something, maybe this is you want to skip this episode because yeah. we're going to be saying some of these some of these nasty words. Yeah. So the full title, Nine Nasty Words, English in the Gutter, Then, Now and Forever. So you have a double double subtitle on this one, which I always like to see. And um, so why don't I mean. Okay, actually, I want to start just at the beginning, the very beginning. You have a very funny historical I don't, instance, anecdote. I'll just, I'll just read it. And so this is, this is um, from the introduction. You say, Babe Ruth's parents had a rocky marriage. Mr. Ruth ran a bar. Apparently, the bartender and Mrs. Ruth had eyes for each other and did something about it. Mr. Ruth knew it and got a lawyer to have the bartender sign an affidavit. The document survives and reads, quote, I, the undersigned, I, the undersigned, fucked Mrs. George H. H. Ruth, March 12th, 1906, on her dinging room floor, which mm-hmm. she asked me to do. So that's a <laughs> remarkable <laughs> historical document for, in any event, that, <laughs> let alone that it's Babe Ruth's mother. And so you bring that up to show that, you know, I think the, one of the themes of the book is the meaning of words is always changing. And um, what we attach to them now is maybe not what they meant to a different <laughs> a different era of of people <laughs> such that in a legal document someone would say i fucked her on the dinging <laughs> room floor and so there's some misspellings of this and so forth so how did you yeah why did you want to start with that <laughs> with that little <laughs> i love that little anecdote it's 1906 i remember i mentioned it on lexicon valley and the voice i did for it was i the undersigned i figured that's the way that person <laughs> talked and for some reason he pronounces fucked as duked but you know that was very important because it showed that Ordinary people before about 10 minutes ago used salty and even profane language. That was the point that I wanted to make. But also, we're shocked to read that now. We, this is somebody in 1906 wearing too many clothes. You know, it's this post-Victorian era. And so you assume that nobody would say, and much less put it in affidavit. And there's a question as to why he was allowed to put it that way, because that's not what people were normally doing, but he just you know, says what he says. But that shows how people were talking in that Baltimore bar in 1906. And so the idea was to show that profanity is not new, And that the way people actually talk has always been different from the way they're depicted talking in formal sources. And yeah, also with that one, I happened to be reading that biography and I knew nobody thinking about the word fuck is going to know about this particular thing except me who happens to be reading this while writing that other book. So that just had to go in somehow. Yeah. Okay, well. Thank you for you know to you and whoever originally you know dug this document up. So we have we have the history <laughs> of this bizarre instance, and yes, yeah, so you have a lot of you know um, various sources, and go you're going back a long time. And so one of the I mean, so one of the basic things when you're for the subject is you know we think of these these words, these you know oaths or slurs or curse words as more something you would say than maybe something you would write. And in the pre, so, but we only have evidence of spoken language, you know, exactly for a hundred plus, I don't know, 150 years, maybe. Right. Um, and so you're to try to understand where fuck or something comes from. You have to look at the 
the written record, but then maybe that, you know, if people do as a bad word or something, they would be less likely to write it. And so the original, you talk about the first like written instance of fuck is this very strange, like coded reference <laughs> to the yeah. word. It's funny. It's this, this weird monk and you know, he's writing, you know, O, and then a weird space, then D and then fucking Abbott. And it's just this marginalia. And so you get this written down. And you think what he's saying is old fucking Abbott and that somebody knocked out the L. But actually, nothing's knocked out. There's no smudge. What it is is, oh, damned fucking Abbott. And what it means is that it's a time when he won't write damned out because blasphemy is everybody's profanity. But you can, if you're sniggering in a kind of a beavis and butthead style, you can write fucking. And so there you go with the, the first, you know, prose attestation other than names, where there are people running around in the 11 and 1200 with names like, you know, Roger Fuck by the Naval and Henry Fuck Butter. And it's not even, it's not like somebody in a play or something. These are ordinary people running around having real lives because the word then was salty, but not profane. It's a, it, it's a weird history to see because we live in a time when just 10 minutes ago, you weren't, weren't going to write the word down unless you were trying to make a point, despite the fact that there's all evidence that people were saying it all the time. The fun of nine nasty words is you have to trace the history of words that you weren't supposed to allow existed when you wrote something down before there's a such thing as the recorded voice. So it's an interesting challenge. Right. And and the fact that, you know, someone, you know, 500 years ago was complaining about their manager or boss, essentially, is like, right. that, that fucking guy, I mean, that, that's a real, you know, <laughs> there's something about human nature. You wouldn't where, expect it. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, people are always going to be complaining about their bosses or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, well, I did want to talk about that, you know, fuck by the navel and these other things. So there's people who are like recorded in, you know, middle, you know, the middle ages of England, who their name is fuck by their last name is like fuck by the navel or something like that. So what does that tell us about <laughs> this word? That is, like, <laughs> it tells us word? that there's a history and nine nasty words has a history. It starts with God. It's all about God and Jesus. And you're not supposed to use those words trivially. So you can swear by God if you really mean it, but you're not supposed to swear by God if you hit your finger with a hammer or something like that, because these are considered to be real things and you don't speak of them lightly. You don't speak of them in vain. That's where the old idea comes from, that you don't use the Lord's name in vain, because for people like this. Really, most people are illiterate. It's an oral society. How do you make a signature in an oral society? You can make an X, but really swearing is very important because that is putting your name to something for somebody who has no sense of language as written down. So there's a time when what's profane is to swear in vain. But in terms of what goes into your body or what comes out of it, of course, in any society, those things are salty, but they're not profane. They're not taboo. And that's why you have grope cunt lane. That's why you have Roger fuck by the navel written down as if that was normal, because to them, it was. It's only later that those words also go behind the curtain. Right. So, yeah. So the earliest bad words in English uh, were words related to, um, you know, faith and uh Christ and God and damnation and hellfire and, and so forth. Exactly. And, um, and whereas today those are maybe the mildest of the words that are in, that are in your, uh, your book of the shit, <laughs> shit is sort of around there. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, damn is, you know, I, I don't think a, a small child, unless the family was religious, would get in trouble for saying damn or something. No. Um, I almost didn't include damn and hell. I kind of thought they're not profane. But then I realized if you're going to write a book like this that anybody's going to want to read, you have to have some kind of narrative tension. And I thought that's going to be the history. So you start with damn and hell being really bad words. And even though we now spontaneously put them on the list, you know, neither you nor I think of those as curse words, as opposed to the, the classic four letter words referring to the body, where however we relate to them, we know that they have a certain profane status. But yeah, damn and hell used to be serious stuff. And you could say that they were until roughly the late 19th century. And so I try to get that across. I dreaded writing those chapters because I thought these words aren't interesting. They were back then. It's only now that we don't care. Right. And I mean, profane, yeah, I assume the, the origin of profane, like sacred and profane, you know, and so profanity comes from this Idea Precisely, of, exactly. Prof profaning something that's holy, uh, mm -hmm. I, I would guess. Um, okay, so then, yeah, so, but that is maybe, uh, you know, so we're not so concerned with those words now. And you have some, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff like 
you know, cripes or zoons or something, or some of these words maybe like would be in a cartoon from Christ. the 1950s yeah. or something, which are like ways not to say, you know, Christ wound, Christ's wounds or something like that. Exactly. Um, and yeah, Jeepers Creepers and other, other kind of things like this are all ways to not say, uh, you know, t- take, take a, take an oath. Okay. So we talked about, we talked about fuck a little bit, but okay. What is, <laughs> what is <laughs> the best understanding of where fuck comes from? Because that is, the ultimate yeah. curse word, I think. You know, to tell you the truth, I suppose, in the very literal sense of that word, I think Old English probably had a word, fuck, and that it comes down from that, and that goes back to the roots of all Germanic languages. However, in the corpus of Old English, such as it is, there is not that word. And so there's room for supposing that English borrowed it from the marauding Vikings, because they do have a word, fuga, or did have a word, fuga. I'm skeptical because you assume that the society has its own word for that and it's not going to be replaced by a word used by some invaders. But then on the other hand, these are invaders who married English speaking women and became part of the society. So it may have come from something going on in Norwegian. The truth will probably never be known, but it's an antique German Germanic word. And you can find it littered throughout German and the Scandinavian languages, as well as earlier English. There's this word family of words that roughly begin with f and end with something like k or ch and they refer to things having to do with something moving back and forth you know it's going to be you're putting a stick into a hole or it's going to be that you're playing the violin or you're you're slashing some stick it's clear what the core meaning is and that one of them ended up having to do with what it has to do with exactly when and where we may not know because once again nobody was going to be writing it down Mm -hmm. um you talk a little bit about, and this is, I think, probably something most people, English speaking people realize, you know, maybe when they're around like 10 years old or something, that a lot of the curse words kind of sound similar and they have this hard sound at the end, like k or t. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and they're sure, four letters. How do, is that unique to English? How does that, um, is, 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 it, is that just a uh, happenstance or, or what, how did, yeah. how did that come about? Yeah, I have to give the boring answer. That's an English thing. I don't think it has anything to do with Anglophones liking things to be short, snappy, and mean or something like that. But in our language, I think partly because of the way the first few curse words happen to be shaped, we like our curse words to end and begin with a consonant, preferably ones that have a nice snap. And you can kind of see things happening, even with slurs. And so the unfortunate word for lesbian, dyke, starts out really as bull diker and gradually get shorter into dyke. It's as if to speak English is to want the word to be like that. And so that's our shape. Now go into another language and there's no preference for that, but ours are that way, which makes them well suited for erupting out of the right sides of our brains. But yeah, it's to be an Anglophone to assume that the dirty words are going to sound like <clears throat> that's not true in all languages. Right. And then, and then often the, um, you know, the, the, replacement word like fudge for fuck mm-hmm. it, it like softens it or what mm-hmm. they go well darn and damn i guess that doesn't exactly line up but and then heck for hell it adds it so maybe there, maybe that's not a rule there but um i see yeah. where you were going though and so you know there's shit and then there's shite which is a little longer and seems a little you know a little gentler and then fudge which yeah. soft a little bit well, it would be I, interesting to see if you could find a pattern here. yeah i i'm i have a when i was in middle school i uh, had a friend whose mom wouldn't um let him say uh this sucks which was a very popular thing to say you know in 1994 and <laughs> so that you know i guess the maybe you know it ultimately is a reference to oral sex but also the fact that it's like rhymes with fuck i guess was was considered sort of edging onto bad behavior also it um, helps and also that it's a short word and it ends in that consonant it feels nasty that that's part of it too nobody would say that inhales that wouldn't have caught on it's right. the suck and yes and what it rhymes with yeah um okay let's uh let's skip ahead a little bit let's talk about ass um <laughs> and so so th- i mean th- you talk about how okay we have ass referring to a part of the human body and then we have ass the animal and then you know if you are like reading like a certain translation of the bible they're talking about asses and and then like the little kids are like snickering and wondering what's going on so how did how did ass um end up being our, our word 
it's the funniest thing with that word because <laughs> the word for the donkey thing and the word for the buttocks just happen to be similar by accident. But once you start having the word for the buttocks having a certain profanity about it, then it naturally starts to be compared to this kind of humble and cantankerous animal. All of that is an accident, but Shakespeare starts doing it. And the amazing thing about ass is that it becomes a, a piece of grammar. And so you say something like, um, he was a big ass man, which somebody could have been saying even in the late 19th century. And that means that he has a large behind and maybe, you know, that he's a large belly, what, whatever. But then that ends up spreading and the meaning gets more general. And after a while, a big ass man doesn't mean that his ass was big. It just means that he's big, but not in the way that many people think. Many people think that when you use ass in that way, you're saying very, and that you mean that in a way that the person has a big ass or something like that. But then again, just yesterday, one of my, we're somewhere like, if anybody's looking at this, it's not that I'm the Unabomber in some log cabin. I'm, I'm in a late side <laughs> bungalow. And there was a black squirrel. And one of my daughters said, oh, look, it's a black squirrel. And I thought randomly that could be, oh, look, it's a black ass squirrel. If it were somebody older and a little more profane and you don't mean that it has, you know, black buttocks and you don't mean, you know, there's nothing about the squirrel that you mean other than that it's black. What you mean is, oh, squirrels are supposed to be gray in our world. That one is black. So ass doesn't mean anything about size or buttocks anymore. It marks that something is counterintuitive of all things. And so she's going out with some rich ass man, meaning you wouldn't expect her to be doing it. It's a red ass piano. It doesn't mean that the piano is bright red. It means that pianos are supposed to be black or brown. And so ass has had this strange evolution from referring to the gluteal to being this subtle grammatical marker of what strikes you as unexpected. I find that just marvelous. Yeah. And you get into a lot of this sort of stuff about how the words work in terms of grammar and you have sort of I mean, maybe we'll talk about pronouns just a little bit, um, but the, the way that some of these words, uh, you know, curse words can substitute as pronouns mm -hmm. or, and j just serve different grammatical roles aside from their plain meaning. Um, I, I, I wanted to, this is an anecdote, I, I guess I've been waiting to mention for about 20 years when I was in college and taking the um, intro, the required class for the English major, you had to start with the Canterbury Tales and there is, um, this first tale, the first tale is the knight's tale. It's just very long and sort of ornate and sort of boring. And then there's this, the second tale, the Miller, I think, or, uh, but it's like a sort of a parody version of the, of the first one. And things this, are fun in that one. Yeah. And exactly. there's a key part where someone is, is like in the dark or something. And then someone is, is tricked into kissing someone else's ass. And <laughs> when I, and the word in the middle English, I think was E R S. And mm -hmm. so when I read it the first time, I thought it meant ear. Um, because it wasn't like whatever Kissing version. Kissing upon the ears. Right? Whatever version I had did not. Um, because I guess that's a bad word. It didn't get the translation <laughs> for that word, and so it was like I, I think it's even a hairy ear. Um, so it's like someone is tricking. Yeah. The, it's like okay, hairy ear. That's not so bad. But then I realized it's it's actually arse, <laughs> and um, and yeah. So it, so you know, so seven hundred years ago or whatever, people were joking about you know kissing they hairy asses and so forth. Right. Um, okay, let's okay, let's talk about. Um, okay, so there's one word in here that I will not say, um, and I think you probably know what that word is. And you, you I had do. A, you had a piece in the, in the New York Times op-ed <laughs> a, a couple months ago about this about this word, and that is the word that we some of us are not going to say. That's right. Yeah. And so that one is it's it's different in a lot of ways from the other ones. Can you talk about? Well, I mean, you know, people including I think actually didn't. I feel like a decade or more ago, maybe you, you talked to the author of the book that had that title, but it wasn't the N word. It was the actual word on blogging heads. I, or, but I think he had written the Boy, book institutional before, but, blogging heads memory. Yeah. But Randall I remember Kennedy. at the time, yes, but yeah. I remember at the time thinking, you know, I was the person writing out the titles that would appear, you know, should I write the word? Like, like the, the book is on Amazon with, you know, with the word and it's of course become more fraught, since then um yeah. but it is you know it's like you see yeah so, so people have written whole books about this one particular word and we're just gonna maybe talk about it briefly but um i mean did you think about not including this word because it's not the same as some of the other ones right well you know the fact that you and i are not saying it and the fact that randall kennedy wrote a book 
It came out in 2001. It was called Nigger. Notice how we all jump, and I'm black myself. But no one jumped 20 years ago. The idea was you're referring to it. You're not using the word. Now, some people didn't approve. He caught some hell from some black writers. Nevertheless, it was called that, and you could say it. Some people, I remember NPR was a little little ticklish about saying it, but a lot of people just called it what it was, and you just thought of it that way. It's only been 20 years, and now, you know, I only referred to it by the name just now for the effect. And that's because the word has taken on a real taboo status. And that is how people processed words like fuck and shit, say 200, 300, even 100 years ago. The editor, Maxwell Perkins, could not say the word fuck with his hard drinking macho self. He's editing Fitzgerald and Hemingway, and he has to write the word fuck on his desk calendar and show people if he's referring to the word. He wasn't strange. That was just, you know, a a man who's, you know, civilized a hundred years ago. And we think, oh, how weird. We're the exact same way with the N-word. And so it's become profane. So when I was writing this book, I was thinking, You know, I certainly don't think of shit and fuck as profanity. I use them daily, including in front of my kids. But I thought, and I don't think the thought is unique to me, but I thought our profanity is the slurs. And to be honest, Arya, I I thought that means I kind of thought I'm going to write about faggot, bitch. And I thought, oh, I have to write about the other one. And being who I am, I've written about that word before. And I kind of thought, if I write about that, everybody's going to think that the book is really about that. But then I decided I can't not have it in there. And look what's happened, especially because of how things have been in the country since last summer. So to me, Nine Nasty Words is the fuck book. That's what my my little (laughs) girls call it. I wanted to write about that. And then I figured I'd pad it out with everything else because you can't do a whole book about fuck because somebody else has already done it. But I can tell that it's going to go down as the one where I had some insights about the N-word, which I contributed. But no, it's not different from the others. To me, the N-word is our fuck a hundred years ago it's just that time goes by we've gone from the blasphemy to the body to slurs which is intelligent in a way i mean it's evidence of a kind of a moral i think people go a little too far sometimes but it's evidence of a kind of a moral development but that's the story of our bad words from oh my god to you and i not uttering that word that's our profanity yeah so so when that piece ran on the op-ed page of the times they included an editor's note sort of laying out why they decided to not, um, you know, blank out the word or something. And, you know, the times is interesting as, as looking at it as sort of like the arbiter of what is acceptable, not. And 10 or so years ago, there was a play that I think Chris Rock was in on Broadway called the motherfucker in the hat or the motherfucker with a hat. I remember it. They refer to it in different ways. And sometimes it was just the blank with a hat yeah. or the mother yeah. blank with a hat. And so if it was the blank with a hat, you really had, and you didn't know what it was, really had what no sense it? of what this right. is. And so, yeah. So at some point, you know, they wouldn't print motherfucker. Um, and they generally don't print curse words unless it's like a direct quote that has some, um, you know, uh, news value, I guess. And so like when Trump said, grab him by the pussy, you know, they probably wouldn't, that probably made pussy a little more acceptable in general to say or, or out loud um, or in the news or something. But so they'll print that kind of stuff, but, um, but they have, you know, they're still a little bit like uh, precious or something or. Yeah. About that. So how did you, I mean, did they, um, was there thought like, well, we can't run this at all because it has this horrible word in it so many times or how did that work? Um, the times wanted to do an excerpt and um, someone else, uh, the, someone else had already done fuck and my memory's already fading, but I think the Atlantic took fuck. And so, or no, the Atlantic did the introduction, but the Times wanted fuck. I mean, the Times wanted the N word. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, Arya, I never really thought about it because, of course, I have a certain dispensation because I'm black and so I can use the word. And so they ran it. To be honest and not to be disrespectful to the Times, I have not read this explanation that they did, which I get the feeling has been read more than the piece itself, but I can understand why they had to do that. But what shows you how taboo the word is at this point is that if I weren't black, I, one, wouldn't have written that chapter at all, and two, the Times would never have printed an excerpt. So the only reason it slips by is if they specify, as I imagine they do, that the writer is black himself. But it means that a white person couldn't write a chapter that's really being informative about the history of the word and the abuses of the word. Today, a white person couldn't write that chapter at all. I find that extreme. 
I'm glad to help by being black myself, but <laughs> it worries me a little bit that it's gotten to that point. Nevertheless, for it to be a profanity, I think is evidence of progress. It's just that if I had my way, we wouldn't take it quite as far as we have, but nobody asked me. And luckily I got to have <laughs> that in the times and that's what really matters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do. I, you know, I was wondering whether when I saw that they ran this and had this, I don't know, so I, I, I was wondering, was like, oh, is there going to be a backlash? And I didn't see, I mean, did, were there people who sent you angry letters about it or? Um... Um, you know, oddly enough, here and there, you know, nobody sends you angry letters anymore. Nowadays, what people <laughs> do is they write the angry letter and they show it on Twitter. Right. I caught a few where the idea seems to be that I was condoning the use of a slur. And, you know, for anybody to read that excerpt and think that that's what I was saying is somebody who you know, didn't read it and was just prepared to hate on me in general in terms of something worth hearing. No, no, not really. I think most people reading it understood that it was about referring to the word. And especially if I'm black myself, I'm not going to, you know, write a slur 50 times. It doesn't make psychological sense. So, no, I think that I think it shows that we 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 are ready to understand the difference between usage and reference. I think there could be a conversation about it that would be more productive than I think a lot of people think, but we'll see. Yeah. And it, you know, you remind me that there was this strange episode with a guy, I can't remember his name, the guy who was the science reporter for the times who like Don McNeil. Yes. Yeah. We don't even need to get into that, but that, you know, okay. So this is still a live issue where, mm -hmm. you know, can you, is this, is this word like the, uh, you know the ult the ultimate thing. If you say if you if a certain person says it, then you know they <laughs> they are right. they're fucked. I mean, I guess I guess right. one way exactly. to put it. Um, <laughs> okay, so so people can check out that that excerpt and and maybe that will make them want to read the full chapter of the full book. Um, let's see, we're probably coming up towards the end of our time. But I did want to ask about this one source or that you I'd never heard of this person before. This is a woman named Lucille Bogan. Yes. Um, can you talk about her? Because she is, I don't know, a font of, or a piece of historical evidence that of the way people were talking in like the 20s or 30s. Um, it seems like- I urge people to listen to her online because it's 1935. It's in very well-preserved sound. She's a blues singer. It's been said that there was Bessie Smith, there was Ma Rainey, then there's Lucille Bogan. I don't think that was quite the truth, but she was a working person and she cut a party record. And quite simply, she uses almost all the words that I have in nine nasty words, um, including, you know, this bull dagger for a person, a, a, a lesbian. And it's just, it's all there, the shit. And, you know, something interesting where the word cock is used to refer to a female as opposed to a male body part. Yeah. And it's all just right there, which just shows you she wasn't unusual. She was just speaking the way people off the cuff in her world spoke in 1935. She even yells, oh, shit, at one point. And I'll bet that is the first outright recorded shit in the history of recorded sound. There's one example <laughs> in, a very, in an early talkie where somebody mumbles it and doesn't know they can be heard. But I think that's probably the first recorded shit. And so you can listen to her and just realize that here it is. It, you know, it might as well be 100 years ago. And she's cursing just like us. And so, you know, the more it changes, the more it's the same. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I need to actually listen to that. I didn't, um, I didn't realize I'd forgotten that, you know, these would be online and you can actually listen to them. Uh, so I do want to check it out. It seems like it, it's definitely an, an interesting historical document. Um, well, maybe the last thing, I, we mentioned the pronouns thing. So, you know, people talk about pronouns a lot with like their gender pronouns and, and so forth. But uh, that is just one particular meaning of the word pronoun and so some of these pronouns are like well like one is um my ass your ass his ass her ass like um their asses um and so there's yeah. a way that these words can like work in, in grammar that is um you know certain or maybe not everyone speaks this way it's more like african-american vernacular english or something but mm -hmm. um they're yeah it's like more it, it, they, they function in these ways i hadn't really thought about that you have, you have new pronouns. And so yeah, I'm going to fire his ass. That doesn't mean what it means. I mean, obviously, you know, you're not just going to fire his buttocks. What you mean is I'm going to fire him. And you even have the same melody. I'm going to fire his ass. What you just mean is that you're going to fire him and you're indicating a kind of disrespect. So it's a pronoun. His ass can be analyzed even by, you know, the, the kind of linguist who analyzes these things in great detail. 
it's a, it's a pronoun. It starts as referring to a body part, but now we've got something new. Same thing with I hate that shit. Rarely do you say that and refer to feces. You mean, I hate that, but you're expressing a certain kind of disrespect to it. And so you can have a whole list of pronouns that you didn't know existed. And so, for example, me, him, it, or me, you, him, it. It can be also my ass, your ass, his ass, that shit. Those are pronouns, too. So honest English that a Martian would hear and just write down, not knowing about the sociology, the Martian would say when people are expressing disrespect, the pronouns change shape. And that is what that Martian would hear. Right. And uh, you remind me of I can't remember where I first heard someone say this, but, you know, any um, movie that isn't R rated is sort of like a lie in some sense, because people freely curse all the time and people say fuck constantly you know if they stub their toe or something they say fuck and so um the yeah the these words are you know within <laughs> lived experience all the time even if they still do carry some taboo um Definitely. and okay maybe maybe we should wrap up there do anything else you want to add about the uh about the book i think we have done a very good pricey of what the book covers definitely thank you yeah. for letting me talk about it so there's, yeah and and we didn't even mention all the words um Bitch, that's in there. Uh, <laughs> should let them have a surprise. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's at least nine, uh, and um, I th- actually think you must have more than nine because there are twelve there variants on. You've got motherfucker, and yeah, it's it's twelve words. That's right. Nine alliterated. Well, it's twelve terrible <laughs> words. Put it that way. Oh, that's <laughs> funny. And yeah, and I mean, of course, you think of the um of George Carlin's old thing, but some of his like he had tits in there, and and that's you know, so his yeah, everyone. I guess people have different lists. Okay, so the, I'm holding up the book now. <laughs> Nine nasty words. Uh, so, John, thank you so much um, for thank talking you, about the book, you? and uh, I enjoyed reading it. People should go and buy it wherever they buy books. And um, <laughs> okay, so th- <laughs> thank you again. Thank you, Arya.